Today is April the 1st, 2022. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University Library, and I'm here in the new, relatively new, central plant on the OSU campus to stop to talk with Steve Cookerly, and that he is currently the manager of the distribution systems in the energy services department here at OSU. But he started back in November of 1988 in what was called the Physical Plant Electrical Shop. That's right. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. We're going to learn a little bit about Steve's career, this new facility, and then get into a little bit about the library bells and in relation to a couple of events that have occurred here on campus. But before we get to that, let's learn a little bit about you. Start wherever you might like. Very good. My name is Steve Cookerly. I'm blessed to be married to my wife, Gail, for in excess of 40 years now. Uh, we have two children, Taylor Sadler and her husband, Cody. Uh, my son, Seth Cookerly, and his wife, Stephanie, who blessed us with five grandchildren. Uh, we have a small location out in the country and spend a lot of time with our animals and with our grandchildren. And where did you attend high school? Uh, Clinton, Oklahoma. Clinton Red Tornadoes. Clinton, okay. And what year did you graduate? 1978. And what were your plans at that point? Law school. Law school? Yes, ma'am. And did you go or? No, ma'am. No. What, what, what detour did you take? Lots of hours, lots of hours at Southwestern Oklahoma State. Transferred to Oklahoma State after a stint in New Oil Field. And um, just to be very blunt, uh, went and got my contractor's license to become an electrical contractor and needed some time. Needed some time uh, not being native to Stillwater to develop a clientele, and so I came to the university in 1988. And uh, being a father, uh, being a good husband, probably meant more to me than being a businessman. So the university has been a blessing for me and for my family, providing us income, stability, um, opportunities that we may not have had in smaller communities. So. It was just a great place to raise our family. Do you remember your first day on the job? No. <laughs> no, that's okay. No, I don't. Do you know where your? Do you remember where your office? What building you were working out of? Yes, ma'am. It was the. It was the, still the existing facilities management facility. Okay, out down that way. Yes, ma'am. Out <laughs> on the street. I have to get the lay of the land again in my head. Yes, ma'am. So you, you came to OSU as a student for a short amount of time? For two years. For two years. Majoring in? Electrical engineering at okay. that time. And you got the bug then? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you have brothers and sisters? I have one brother, James. Uh, he's retired, living in Clinton, Oklahoma now. Older? Younger? Uh, definitely my older brother. Older. <laughs> yeah. And I still have my mom. She's in Oklahoma City. Okay. Lost my father back in 97 and uh, very blessed to have him as my dad and my father. So, And what did they do for a living? Uh, my mother was a manager, retail manager in Oklahoma City and uh, was a homemaker when we lived down in Clinton mainly. Uh, my dad was a, was an agent for the Bureau of Investigation. So we traveled quite a bit, moved. So Clinton is on Route 66, right? Right on it, yes ma'am. <laughs> any stories about that? Hmm. Probably just the, the people that I pulled out in front of when I was going <laughs> to work out on my way more than anything. No, a little bit of horn blowing. It was, it was just an absolutely beautiful place to, to be raised. The people, there's a toughness to the, to the quality of toughness to the people in western Oklahoma. I think when the wind blows every day like it does out there in the, the dry conditions, it it tends to, you tend to develop that, that durability maybe. So, well, how had their families come to be in Oklahoma? Were they, had they migrated here from another state or do you know how your parents came, how their parents, I guess, came to be? I really don't. My father was offered a job as a police officer in Ponca City. Uh, they were living in Kansas at the time. Okay. So um, I know that's what brought them to Ponca City was working for uh, Chief Lewis Speck there in Ponca. So uh, then he went to the to the uh, FBI Academy and carried off on another career there. So where do you call home? Stillwater or, or Clinton? 
Oh, definitely. It's it's just or Perkins, I guess. Yes, ma'am. Definitely Perkins and still water. Okay. Yeah, I've been gone from out there for forty some years now, so love the community, but I've just learned that home is home is where you put your hat each night. Okay. So when you first started, you were in the electrical shop. What were some of the things you were uh, in charge of doing? At, do you? Actually, when I started, ma'am, I was just an electrician, so okay. mainly just fixing electrical issues on campus and installing some new electricity when needed. And that was before computers came on board? Yes, ma'am. And matter of fact, uh, in preparing, trying to prepare, uh, my emails are, are archived, so I was <laughs> trying to find some pertinent information for our discussion this morning. and. I couldn't find anything before 2013 now, so I went to my file cabinets, and I have four file cabinets full of files that we actually do need to get scanned in, because I've got some very, very good information in there, but unfortunately didn't come up with much for our conversation. So yes, everything, and if you look in my, my folder, you'll find that I have two legal pads in there, and that's pretty much how I still exist day to day. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm thinking in 1988, what was the building that needed the most work, uh, electrical mm -hmm. work? We still had a lot of buildings that were post World War II, where the GIs, when they came back, we had a lot. Of, we had we had not a lot, but several of the Quonset huts. Uh, oh. As a matter of fact, my uh, my stepfather, uh, Jack Fairbairn, um, served in World War II in the Navy, and when he came back, he came up to OSU, and uh, he would tell me about the barracks and, and staying in the barracks up here with all the other GIs on GI Bill. So uh, I know there was a response to be able to get uh, help those guys and it just, well, he got his degree out of the deal. He left uh, high school um, before graduation to join the Navy and was able to get his high school, degree, his high school diploma and come straight up here to go go to uh, go to school and get his degree. Lived in Vet Village? Well, could he could have lived in Vet, Vet Village. It's you know, I've, I've never heard the term before, but that may be the case. It was where uh, ATRC currently resides. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a general area yes, where some of that was, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think, I think the university over the years has always been really good about adapting for the current needs. Okay. And then 19... I was reading, and not, you may not remember this, it may have been before you came, but in 1988, a, a student project computerized the bells, tried to computerize the bells on the library to play just a tune that had never been done before. And as a class project, they did that. I don't know how soon after that they started doing, like now they do the alma mater at noon. Yes, ma'am. So that may have happened after while you were, after you joined OSU. What I remember about the library bills is there was an antiquated system that, uh, and I'm, I'm just very sorry, I, I, I think it was still a Shulmeric Carillon's company um, installation, but I just remember there were lots of tubes, um, and I'm not really very good with electronics and sound, but there were a lot of, it was, it was the old tube type, and. We actually, I was part of the crew that removed all of the old equipment and then put the new electronic carillons up into the tower. Uh, we removed all the old speakers and installed the new and actually did the installation in house on that particular setup. But prior to, yeah. ma'am, I don't know. That's I okay. do, I do remember the um, the carillons coming on for the first time though, and. and uh, there was a lot of interest in being able to play music, and some absolutely loved it, and others didn't. So, <laughs> do you know, and you may not. Do you happen to remember about when that happened? When they put in the new? Ma'am, I'm going to say it was probably it was pre '95, but I, I don't. I actually will have the records somewhere. <laughs> That's some of those records when they get scanned in before my retirement. Okay. Uh, um, I would say somewhere around 92. But I know when we came in 96, they were already already there, right. so it had to be early. Yes. We'll say early 90s then. How's that? We had a lot of trouble with the old system, and it was just it was just past its time. So uh, the new Carillons, uh, Adrian Silf was instrumental in getting the design and, and getting them put in. It was 
he was the assistant director at the physical plant on his retirement. Okay. So the old ones, I'm assuming, were put in in like 53 when the library opened. It opened in 53, so they wouldn't have been 50, you know, pushing 50 years then, close to 50 years. Yes, ma'am. Potentially. Yeah, potentially. I can tell you this, they were definitely, it was time for them to go. It was old, okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> So do you have any memory of when they might have started doing the Christmas tunes in December? I mean, they've been doing that since I was when we, since we came to I'm, I'm, I feel I feel pretty certain that, that we actually programmed in there there are four libraries in that in that Shulmary Carillon electronic player. Um, and one of them is a seasonal library. So it had uh, patriotic tunes for the 4th of July, perhaps, or any type of national celebration. It had uh, a popular library that had some uh, some selections by uh, the Beatles, some Motown okay. uh, uh, entries. Uh, the seasonal was, uh, that's where the Christmas came from. And, and we would do random play or Whatever the selection was, we just took the cue from the from the president's office, and generally somebody there would talk to uh, Dr. Bosserman or, or uh, Dr. Birdwell, whoever was there at the time, and that would then get transpired and get transferred down to our area. Okay, I wondered what the chain of command was. <laughs> My understanding was it always came directly from the president's be. office, but I, I, I'm sure that whomever it was delegated to handled it. So at one time they actually played popular tunes? We played a popular tune occasionally, but not often. Okay. We had a request at one point uh, to find out if Shulmary could digitize some of the more current popular tunes and what that looked like. And we, we did have a couple of couple of songs over the time that were digitized. Um, again, the, there was there was pretty pretty good control about what went out over the library tower. So I don't think, for instance, I think one of the tunes was happy. And if you asked me to hum the, the melody, I couldn't do it. So, I know what you're talking about, yeah. But there was, uh, and it was just it was just great ideas to try to lift the spirits on campus or whatever the case might be. But uh, probably the most the most impactful for me again was uh, the the remembrance uh, the the uh, tolling bells for uh, honoring those that we lost or in the state. Yeah, from what I have understand, the, maybe the first time that happened was 1995 for the Murr, Murr building bombing. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. On the anniversary, we were asked to toll the bells a certain number of times and uh, took that quite seriously. We had uh, I don't remember if we had two or three of us that actually went, which it takes one person to operate, but we wanted to make sure that we had someone who would actually be responsible for pressing the toll button. That if you're asked to toll the button four times, that's just pushing a button four times, you would think that that would be a pretty simple task. But for me, the anxiety would be such that I would hit one, two, and then I'll remember if that was three or four. <laughs> so we actually had what we called a counter one person was in charge, the other person of pushing the button, the other person was in charge of actually checking off each time that the button was pushed. Uh, it's quite a little process, but I, I don't believe that we ever had an error with that. And where do you do that? In the library itself? Or? Yes, up on the library, in the library tower is where the actual controller sits. I wondered where it was. Uh, it's in the base of the tower. And then the speakers are, are placed uh, up above on, in the tower itself, facing outward. Okay. And then the next would be 2001 for the plane crash. I think they didn't, they, if my memory serves, they told during the memorial service that first, the first, like when they had the memorial service in Gallagher Iba. But then again, at the anniversary, a year a year later, I don't know if they did at the memorial service or not. What I recall, ma'am, was that to be blunt, I was always up in the tower, and I always took a cue on when to toll at okay. a particular time. Um, so, for me to, to tell you that that was part of that, I believe that to be true. But okay. I really don't have a recollection of what was happening outside. Okay. Uh, just trying to pay attention to what my assignment was. What your finger was doing. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> Getting the count right. So, 
So that would be 10 for that one, and then for the, remember, the four would be four. I don't know what it would be for the Murr building. There were too yeah. many. No, it wasn't 167 totals, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember. It was early in the morning, 910 or something, yeah. and I don't, I don't remember the number of totals. But um, again, it's something that we were honored to be to be asked to assist with the memory. Don't you love cell phones? Yep. Yeah. My apologies. <laughs> Speaking of bells, huh? yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, how many can be up in the build, in the, the tower at one time? There's, I mean, from the ground, it look, doesn't look that big, but how many people can actually be up the, where you the, are? In the in the base of the the library tower, the area I'm going to guess is around uh, twenty five to thirty feet wide, and oh, several people probably. Um, oh yes, ma'am, probably close to twenty feet long. So. And then there's a spiral staircase that goes up the library tower and okay. uh, has different levels and different different areas to maintain for the windows, for example. And then there's actually an outside walkway where the speakers are located, and as well as we put in a, a color changing lighting system that where we could turn the library tower orange, for example, whenever uh, whenever one of our athletic teams or for homecoming. Oh, yes. turn the library tower orange for those sorts of things. Okay. I wondered that was after you came, or were they already doing that when you? No, that was something we put in. Okay. Is it? Can it? Are those the only two colors? I mean, orange and then the white. Are there other colors? The first system that we put in um, had a lot of different color hues available. There were LED. Um, <laughs> When my wife and I moved to the farm, we couldn't. Uh, I don't have Wi-Fi at our at our house at our home. We can't get it there in the valley we live in. So I would actually have to go out and listen to the football game on the on the radio in one of our vehicles to see if we won or not. Because we do have a tendency to win in the last few seconds. <laughs> so and at that point, then from my cell phone, I would change the color to orange. Uh, so anyhow. They, there's a variety of colors. Very seldom did we do anything. We did have a request, I think, on uh, St. Patrick's Day to turn it green, for example. Uh, but mm -hmm. most of the time, it's just either white or orange. So you can do it from your cell phone now. That's that's. Oh yes, yeah. ma'am. And actually, I believe the the folks in charge of it that I I, I stopped uh, being I stopped being involved with the library chimes as well as the lighting controllers. Uh, when I took a new position, this distribution manager position, I'm going to say about five, six years ago. So I know they put a new lighting system in since. Well, I didn't realize that they changed the color back if we won. And I know I would notice That's, it was orange, but I didn't hadn't put that two and two together. That was one of our duties was to make sure that the library tower went orange still. If they win, if but if if they don't win, no, no. Oh, but most of the time we're turning it orange now. <laughs> I, I don't know if they still do or not. So I'll pay attention. I don't want to walk on that hair cloth. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> and you can do it from your cell phone. You can't program the bells though. From that's not that simple to do from a cell phone, is it? Ma'am, I won't tell you that you can't today. Yeah, I would have you no don't. doubt that Shamaric would actually have that that uh, available. It would surprise me if they did not. But uh, the last that I knew, it was still not remote programmable. Okay. So we'll switch gears back from 1988 until 2015. Did you do other things? Or were you just, you probably continued to add to your duties? Well, um, I don't remember when I became the, the manager of what was called a, a electrical, just the electrical manager for the university. So. Pretty much took care of everything from the substations where we purchased power from Oklahoma Gas and Electric OGE um, out to campus. Uh, we put in the we installed a fiber optic cable, a telephone cable for the campus for new facilities uh, for upgrades, uh, as well as all of the high voltage electricity, the transformers outside, all of the electrical systems within the buildings, all the way to the receptacle or the Cap 5E data drop. So we had a very large crew and, and 
did most of the installation as well as the as well as the maintenance of this. So there's wires all over campus. There is. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> that's correct. How about the uh, Kai clock? The Kai O clock. The Kai Omega clock. Yep. Uh, been kind of a challenge, to be honest. Here, a few years ago, there was an effort that was led to to update the clock, and it was in really in, in great need of, of repair and, and upgrade. And um, I think that our operations and maintenance folks kind of led that challenge, and uh, we did get new new componentry. So it's not quite such the maintenance issue, or for me, the embarrassment that it once was, because it, it really was constantly. Uh, one of the faces was showing the time off. Uh, when the student union was renovated, the area uh, all surrounding the Kyle Mega clock was updated as well. Uh, really helped a lot. They addressed some of those issues. And again, our, our O&M department, led by Jeff Sweet, really helped get that Kyle Mega clock uh, up in better shape. We do still maintain the Kyle Mega clock. Most of the time we're contracting that work out currently because of our lack of equipment to get in there and uh, because of all the hardscapes that were placed around me. Okay. But the, that clock, the Centennial clock that was installed over by Old Central and then the, the, uh, the clock at West Watkins CITD, uh, we take care of those. I forgot about that one. What about the one in the library, the huge, huge one on the wall in the library? Do we do that ourselves? That's actually inside. That would be Jeff, Jeff Sweden's group with operations and maintenance, and I'm not sure which division's in charge of it. We, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I, I know it's over there, but yeah. since it's inside the buildings, I don't personally have anything to do with it anymore. Okay. So you, you kind of somewhat dread spring forward and fall back? <laughs> you know, most of them are electronic updates now, similar to our cell phones or the uh, and so they most of them don't. They're, they're not that big of an issue. Well, the one in the library is not. They have to get up and actually do it, I think. Right. And <laughs> I've, I've spent my time doing that as well. We used to have we used to have clocks in the hallways that we had two people that would spend all day and uh, actually had an evening crew even. They still do over at the uh, facilities management group. And when I when I had those, those folks working with me in my group, then that was the duty that was assigned to them, was change all the hall clocks, advance of one hour. I need to think about the little details like that we don't think about, but we appreciate that they're done. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> so I was reading that this building here where we're today was, they broke ground in 2015 for it okay. and finished it in, what, 17 maybe? It took them a couple of years. Yes, ma'am. So that was about the time they were reorganizing the whole departments and such. Agreed. I yes, thought that that was going on. Yeah, we were housed in the power plant one block to the south for about a year or two over there during the interim before this building was ready for occupancy. And then we moved in uh, probably 2017. Okay. And uh, it just had said projected finish date was like December of 2017. And I know that's always a soft. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> a soft date. And I'm, again, as, as we discussed, I'm really bad with times and dates, but that's about the time frame's about right there, about four or five years ago. And it, it's a pretty snazzy building compared to the other one. One of the things that our long range group stressed was they wanted this facility to blend in with the rest of campus and not have that industrial appearance or that industrial feel. So the architects that work on the project, our engineering staff that work with them, Long range specifically did a fantastic job, uh, in my opinion, of the design for the facility. Uh, as far as aesthetically, uh, most people do not realize this is a power plant. Mm -hmm. So, act actually, um, really, really great, a great cooperative effort. Washington Street. Uh, I still see this as the as the north entrance into the university. So to represent well and, and what a blessing to come by Old Bridge Stadium now and Sherman Smith and uh, I just see this will this will be a great entrance at some point in the near future in my opinion. And I was reading that you have a classroom in the building? We do in the basement yes ma'am there's, there's a CEA2 classroom uh, where students can actually and I don't 
I don't get involved with any of this. I'm just, what I understand to be true is that the, the students can actually, as part of their curriculum, they're actually allowed to come up and actually watch from a distance through windows, not in, not in the active environment, yeah. but watch these uh, 4,000 horsepower chillers that we have in this building, as well as the huge boilers for uh, steam heating the entire campus. Uh, it's really quite an operation. And our power plant staff here, our production side, I do distribution, Kenny Sylvester's over the production side, and he's blessed to work with people that have been here longer than I have in several cases. Um, these guys are, are, they're just the best at doing what they do. Yeah. Keep our campus cool and heat it. Yeah, and I, I know every once in a while someone will come in to check our temperature where we are. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We do have temperature. We have folks here, the technicians that actually help with, with, uh, with the uh, environmental controls inside of each of the buildings on campus. And try to do energy savings. That's yeah. all part of our energy management group. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So while we're talking about that, how about wind? When the wind power part of this? We, Casey Keezer in our energy management group can speak so much more mm -hmm. accurately than I can. I understand around 70% of our power is wind power. Mm -hmm. um, that is a fairly new contract four or five years back. I remember being at uh, a, an energy conference in Oklahoma City with our former director and former assistant director. And I had a gentleman come up to him. He asked if I was from OSU and I said, I, I am, of course. He introduced himself and uh, said he's from Blackwell and that he represented a group that was proposing to build a wind farm west of Blackwell and they wanted to sell power to electricity. Uh, I'm so sell electrical power to Oklahoma State University, my apologies. And I remember thinking, he obviously doesn't understand that we buy at such a reduced rate of just this wonderful rate from Oklahoma Gas and Electric. I went ahead at his request and introduced him to the director, the assistant director, but the Peter principle states that uh, everybody rises to the level of incompetence, if I'm not mistaken. And I definitely am a, am, a, am a living example of that. Because that gentleman who said, we want to build the, this, this wind power plant and sell power to, electric to OSU, again, I thought, you obviously don't have a good grasp of that, what, what's going on here. That's exactly where we buy our wind power from today. The power of vision, the power of dreams. Uh, I just, I, I really don't even remember who the gentleman was, but I do remember meeting him at that time and, and uh, at the risk of being self-effacing in the, in the storytelling here, um, I, uh, we definitely buy wind power. I just wasn't smart enough at the time to realize how important that was going to be. Yeah. It's a big deal. It seems to be a big deal these days. Well, Sustainability, green, green energy. I've taken a, I don't fly a lot, but um, my wife and I flew here not recently, or recently, and I went across West Texas in the, in the nighttime, and, and we were flying in fairly low, getting ready to land in Midland, Odessa, and I remember looking at all of the wind, all the wind farms, and it was just solid red looking lights. And I couldn't figure out for a while what that really was. But if we really pay attention when we travel in the state of Oklahoma, it's much the same. Yes. Um, so, again, my short sightedness, I, uh, I want to poke fun at myself about not being smarter and uh, having a good grasp of what the future may hold. But absolutely. Uh, um, really, really proud to be part of that. Yeah, they have popped up everywhere, just in like in the last, what, 10 years, maybe? Maybe even five years. Without a doubt. And still going in. I saw one last night going through Stillwater all the way on a wind turbine. In Stillwater? Well. Wow. In transit. Oh, going somewhere. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I noticed so they were last time I drove toward Hennessy, they were even starting out that direction. So This one was going west on 51, so <laughs> very would, possibly. Yeah. I understand Stillwater is really not, the environment itself is not suited for wind towers. I know a couple of people have them on their small ones on their 
property. But yeah, right. That, and the the cool. solar solar panels as well. Uh, let's see, Central Electric has a very large solar field south of town here. That um, again, just looking for the future. So, on any given day, what would be on your agenda? Uh, furthering our safety initiatives for for our staff would definitely be my number one agenda. Um, every day is looking at something to do with job hazard analysis. Uh, the technology today, um, for a guy like me, I mean, I'm a legal pad and a ballpoint pen guy, but um, one thing that it does for us is it puts knowledge at our fingertips and um, to be able to get that knowledge into a technician's hands immediately when it's required, when it's needed. Not I have to go back to the office and try to find a key to the supervisor's office to get to the safety manuals. So that's a big part of what we're doing right now is mm -hmm. trying to get our, uh, our safety initiatives uh, up, up to date as well as in the technician's hands for immediate use. Um, currently, what I do, I mean, I have uh, the outside distribution of all utilities on campus, so natural gas, uh, the chill water that's produced here, that cools our buildings, the steam that's produced here, uh, that heats our buildings, um, domestic water, the, the, the distribution of the domestic water from our water plant, that we actually make our own water from Lake Carl Blackwell. Uh, the distribution of that to the facilities, as well as still the high voltage electricity around campus and uh, street lighting, that sort of thing. So about being over that, like if there's, there's a problem and they, you figure out how to, who's going to fix it or that type of thing? We fix it. Yes, you fix it. Pretty much. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Very seldom. We do, we do have to reach out at times, but most of the time we're able to handle them. I'm thinking that when the, when the pandemic first started, water was a water was uh, a hot topic too did you guys have to do anything in particular different for that for my crew particularly we're just over the distribution we okay. have part of our production crew uh, they're actually responsible for the quality of water and we actually work at their request so the credit should go to our production department by by any means that uh, uh, as far as actual the the uh, the actual covid response I'm not so familiar of any any requirements that came down on that side. It was no, really they, more about monitoring the sewer. Oh. For we would actually help with with providing access more than anything to some of our uh, partners in in the city of Stillwater, for example, as well as our research community here on campus. Trying to track the dirt. The, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I mean, initially they were trying thinking they might try to capture some of the water to see if germs were, you know, if they were evidence of it. You know, they didn't know. They just didn't know at that point. Right, and I'm, and I'm just not privy to that. Yeah, it may not be an issue. I know other other universities were doing that, so I may be off, off on that, too. Has COVID impacted your all's work in any, any way? Oh, definitely. I mean, our, we were big proponents of cross-training, so we like to take uh, all of our crew members and have somebody work on one thing and then transfer to another crew and uh, that had to stop because of possible contamination where we were moving one one body to another and to another to another group and um, probably the biggest impact um, for us has been uh, to be honest with you I was at a, in a zoom meeting yesterday and I've never been in a zoom meeting and I had to set it up and so I'm the, like I said, I'm a, pen, I'm a pen and paper guy. So really learning to do things um, uh, through a virtual uh, medium has just been a challenge. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I, I think it's kind of a new normal for us now. That, that's just expected. And we, we definitely require, we definitely request teams access, but when it's the when we have someone else setting up a Zoom meeting, we have we do we're blessed to have folks who are smart about that type of type of thing and help us get that access. But as far as really uh, major major things that impact me or my outfit, uh, ma'am, not really, not really. Just using common sense and, 
and courtesy um, with each other, uh, compassion about if you're not feeling well, stay home. Same thing that everybody that I'm sure that your unit mm -hmm. does the very same thing. Yeah, and masks, initially it was mask, everybody wear masks, but right. that's kind of slacked off lately, so. Yes, ma'am. Maybe, maybe we're at the end, close to the end. In, in our group, most of our guys are working outside and uh, we do work in pairs. So once we stopped moving people for cross training purposes, then it was normally, it was when you come to work, your, your coworker that you get in the pickup with, wear the mask when you're, when you're close and et cetera, if you're not feeling well, stay home. And actually, I think we did pretty well with that. And, and I'm sitting here trying to think in my years of here, I don't remember the, the power going out too many times on campus. Our engineering department led a voltage upgrade on campus um, oh, three to five years ago. It lasted a year or two. And um, to be real, at the library, you were impacted by an outage that would have been time to cross a weekend, probably. Okay. Um, but actually, um, I really hate to say we don't have many outages anymore because I'll be out tonight with an outage. <laughs> But uh, no squirrels. We've gone from literally when I first came to work here, I would tell you that we were out once every two weeks to a month throughout the night fixing something that had burned up in the night. And it was just a matter of a different time. I don't I don't lay fault at anybody's feet. It, it's all about budgeting and and um, I, I don't know. I mean, except to tell you that that um, Utilities are always a hard sell for bond for bonds. Uh, I, I guess what I know to know to say to you is we've been very blessed in the last few years to be able to, to afford to upgrade a lot of our utilities. Administration uh, saw the need and, and has been wonderful about the funding aspect. So uh, we have a fairly new distribution system and we're finishing that up now within the next what the plan is, hopefully in the next three to four years, we'll have all of our system up and completely upgraded. And then do what with the old building? The old building? Yeah. The power plant uh, is scheduled for demolition. When I say scheduled, there's not an active hard date. Again, that's a utilities engineering project that I'm not involved with other than just making sure the utilities are certainly dead to the building when it comes down. I don't have a, a time frame on that, though, ma'am. I can imagine that that will be uh, a major undertaking to remove all of that. I think so. Um, I remember the first time I walked into the power plant that I was totally amazed at how clean everything was. There's a gentleman named Juan Cummings, was the manager at that time, and his, his lead foreman was Bill Burton. And uh, Mr. Cummings and Mr. Burton kept that place spotless. It literally looked like what you would think a ship's galley on a top-notch naval vessel would be. Mm. Uh, just an amazing, amazing plant. And uh, again, it was just time uh, for, for something new and got this beautiful facility now. For me, it's just, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'll miss the old building, <laughs> but it's certainly not in a good location. And, it's amazing how fast I think that uh, Earth takes back what we don't, what we don't exist in. Uh, being abandoned over there, it's it, you can see that it's starting to fall apart. So it's time. Yeah, I was reading it was built in '48. I mean, that's that's a lifespan expectancies past for sure. Actually, a lot of the people who worked in that building are still working in our in our in the new facility here. There's several people that are, and. Uh, those guys used uh, uh, some World War II equipment and kept it running. And that's what I understood was that I know some of the, the turbines over there actually were World War II material. I need to be careful how far I go with that, whether it was the boilers or the turbines. Mm -hmm. but, um, just, just time. It's time, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess it'll be a parking lot or maybe green space. I'm hoping for grass. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Don't know. I don't no. know, but that's the neat thing about, like, again, the administration's had the foresight to to develop the different different groups. LRFP does a really good job of 
listening and then developing designs. Uh, with the beauty. One of the reasons I'm here today is because of the beauty of the campus. When I came here in, in an 88 to go to work, I actually moved to Stillwater in 84 because uh, I was looking for actually petroleum engineering at the time and uh, visited other campuses, two other campuses on, in the state of, and uh, my wife and I both walked on to OSU and said this feels like home. So we moved to Stillwater and enrolled in OSU. Did she enroll in, enroll too? Negative. No. 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 <laughs> okay. We'll check in the we. Yes, ma'am. The uh, campus is really pretty now. It is, and I can imagine that your your work might might pick up a little bit during nice following ice storms that we've had in years past. Power outages that way. We we do. But uh, once again, uh, we've really worked hard over the last over the last uh, thirty years to improve our situation. And uh, about twenty years ago, we received uh, twenty twenty five years ago is when I started really uh, being involved more in the planning and uh, actually overseeing the work. And that was one of our main focuses was making sure that we got our reliability. To a point of respectability as opposed to uh, a cost and apology. So uh, there was definitely funding allowed for on our overhead electric system. And uh, back around 25 years ago, we put a lot of it underground for the just the aesthetic, as well as the fact that we don't have the, uh, the uh, nuisance outages uh, from, uh, from lightning. Uh, Squirrels, uh, squirrels yeah. <laughs> birds actually. When the birds, it's actually beautiful to watch the birds when they're when they're flocking and, and actually, I don't know what you call the rhythmic movements that the flock does, but you can watch out here west of campus and these birds just flow. And it's just a cloud of birds. It's actually beautiful to watch. But the reason I know that is because I've watched more than once when they light on a, on a power power line and then that whole flock moves at one time in unison they'll go wingtip to wingtip and actually short out the, the electrical wires up up in the air like that and it's not an uncommon thing out west of campus so getting all of our electricity underground was a, really a big push for the different administrations of, since i've been here well is speaking of underground stuff did, did your department have anything to do with like the sprinkler system that they've started to put around that's a different <laughs> landscape i guess no that was uh mr dobbs when steve dobbs came okay. uh, steve and i used to office next door to each other and uh, i knew mike burnett prior to steve's arrival mike fantastic individual that led our led our grounds department for many many years steve brought us to a different level without a doubt and uh, once again was blessed with funding and support just like what I'm explaining to what you see today with a very reliable system uh, we did not have 25 years ago so it takes everybody at all levels pulling together to make that happen but Steve with the boots on the ground initiatives uh, that they've put forth and, and he has staff that uh, John Lee is one of the finest men that I've ever come to know uh, and he's actually the interim now since Steve has stepped over uh, to a different position. Those guys are, they, I cannot tell you the comments that I hear. I was in a corporation commission meeting yesterday and I had, I want to say there were three people again on this Zoom meeting. I was really having trouble keeping up, but <laughs> I think there were three people that have been to the Obrade Stadium and they, they both commented that both, all three had commented that they and their spouse had spent time walking on campus and just what a beautiful campus it was. And it is. It is. We're very blessed. Uh, we're very blessed to have the people that would do the work here. You know, you do some electrical still. I mean, energy, I'm thinking of the football stadium lights. Mm. Would that be under your... Not anymore. Not anymore. No, no. Um, I used to actually... Uh, climb those the original Lewis Field lights to fix them. Uh, they always contracted that out, but I always loved the adrenaline, so that was something that we started doing in house as well. But when the new stadium was was built, Lewis uh, Lewis Field lights were taken down at that point, 
and actually it's not that high to climb them anymore because they're actually affixed to the top of the buildings now at uh, Pickens Stadium. But no, uh, athletics actually takes care. They have an actual maintenance staff and they take care of their own equipment now. I'm not sure if they contract that out. I believe they do. So you climb the old ones though? Yes, ma'am. Not afraid of heights then? <laughs> Well, I won't say that. I'm just going to tell you that, that with, with, with age comes wisdom, perhaps. <laughs> You'd have to have a safety harness on, I would imagine, for, for that. We, we should, yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, we won't go any further on that then. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned squirrels, because I mean, you do hear about squirrels getting in transformers, not just on campus, but you know, in the neighborhood. Uh, I have been the I have been the recipient of more than one comment about uh, so did you get your squirrel out to to blame for the power outage? <laughs> well, we've had power outages on campus that have caused major outages that were respond that were literally as uh, one was a tree frog. Uh, the body of the frog, sans legs, was probably one one and a quarter inches long, and actually caused a major power outage on Northeast campus. Um, a mouse, but a mouse do the very same thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it just, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna blame the squirrels alone. <laughs> so you would, back in the day, you would get phone calls at odd times during the night saying that something's gone wrong. What? Still do, yes ma'am. Still do. Yes ma'am. But it's just not, it's again, we Not as often. I can't tell you how happy I am with the fact that I got to be part of the, the, the the upgrades that, that happened and are still continuing to happen. Uh, the commitment that administration has right now to upgrading the electrical uh, system is has just been phenomenal. And I mean that, I, I'm not saying that looking for more funding in the future, I'm just being very honest with you. But when I first came to work here, it was, it was uh, very labor intensive and uh, I'm not, placing us at a higher standard today than I would the gentlemen who were in charge at that time. They just had, they just had a different set of uh, challenges to face and funding was definitely one of them. Well, when you first started, did you have a, a uniform or anything that nothing no, to that just? No, no we have, uh, the only uniforms that we're wearing to this day still, it has been discussed a time or two and, um, we, since we, on my, the group, on my group that takes care of the electrical distribution, those guys have to wear what's called FR, which is flame resistant clothing. It's part of their uh, personal protective equipment, uh, protect them from flashes and fire. And then our utility distribution people have the same thing for working with steam and natural gas. Okay. Well, when I first came in, you said you're thinking about retirement? I am. Yes, you are. But so, but before you do that, like project out like three or four years from now, where do you, or what do you think is going to, what's on the on your radar for the next next few years? As far as personally or at work, either one, both. At, at work, uh, definitely is completing the the electrical upgrade on campus to get the um, uh, we have an adequate medium voltage distribution system that still serves a portion of West Campus and our engineering department has put together a fantastic plan. Saved us a lot of money by, by a lot of self-performance once again. We're going back to uh, self-performing on a lot of the work and uh, that it does it just helps us so much. The, whoever works on that project, once you've actually built it, you know what it is as opposed to receiving something that someone else has built. So that, that project for the next, I would say is probably the next three to four years. Um, I don't know that I'll be here to see the completion of that, but uh, they don't need me here for that. That's one of the, one of the true blessings of a, of a good solid training program. I guess if you do it right, then you can work yourself out of a job perhaps. We have other initiatives as well with our with our utilities. Uh, the new power plant really helped tremendously with our uh, with several of the distribution systems. So uh, I would say that that's probably the biggest thing would be the electrical distribution upgrades. 
and some of the major accomplishments. I mean, one of them would be getting the energy bills lower during your during your thirty some years. We had uh, from the from the cradle to where we are today is is pretty pretty interesting because we started out. I hired a gentleman to work in the evenings. Uh, Mike Batone uh, was the one of the first people that we used, and Mike uh, would call me all hours of the night and let me know that he had, that he, he couldn't get access to an office, for example, and they had their lights on. He was so focused on his work and just a joy to work with. But Mike actually went around at night, and if someone in the library would have left the lights on at night, Mike would go in, turn their lights out, and they just put a small note there that said, <laughs> Uh, thank you, we turned your lights out. Please remember to turn your lights out. And the first letter or two that was written probably wasn't quite as kind as what it could have been. So we rewrote the letter and we had to learn to use a particular type of tape because we made the mistake of using whatever tape was available in the office apparently and it would actually pull the paint at times. So uh, we've gone from that to, I mean, literally it's, you just gotta get the message out. And once again, administration has been uh, been great about leading forward with that that communication and everybody pulling together. I think that there is a common there's a common goal with most people today. I just don't see many people leave their lights on. Uh, that was one of the biggest things: is just turn the light out when you leave the room. Um, the efficiencies uh, uh, just. I don't know what to say other than technology, the advancements in technology have really been amazing. Mm -hmm. LED lighting, for example, um, we've always tried to, to maintain a, a nice balance between cutting edge technology and something that's tried, true, dependable, maintenance friendly. Uh, and sometimes that's, that's, hard to, that's hard to do, but uh, I'm just very proud of the work that we've done. I know, Darren, instead of notes about turning the lights off, I would get some on my, that I'd turn my monitor off. Oh, really? Yeah, so that, that I mean, it's That was after us, because I didn't, I didn't deal with monitors. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it didn't take me long to, to learn that, you know, I should have known that to begin with, because you get busy out the door, you know. The so reason I know that we didn't is because, once again, I'm a pen and paper type guy, so for me to tell you you need to turn your monitor off, that would imply that I know your monitor needs to be off, and that's... When you're in a research facility, as well as a, as a higher education, I mean, we have teaching, but we also have research, and I don't know that the computer doesn't need to be on. Yep. So uh, we just try we just try to do our best with with reminding folks to help keep keep the electric bill down. Yeah. The, the manufacturers in the country, though, it um, it it starts at upper levels everywhere, but people have to really care. I mean, that's really the the. the the end game is you have to, it, it becomes a value as opposed to a request. Well, I mean, some of them, not this one, but I've been in rooms where they turn lights on and when you motion, motion sits. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, so that, 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 you know. It's all perception, I suppose, <laughs> Tanya, because I'm going to tell you that if you just turn the lights out, that's good enough for me. Yeah. Yeah, and just get that metal, that metal value of, I want to say, energy. Yeah. But, I do that at home. Every time I go out of, Husband does not, so I turn out lights behind him. <laughs> you and I are very similar in those respects. So, yeah. don't need it. And if you don't need it, open the curtains. You know, have natural light come in instead. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So it's been a good thirty-three years. This has been a true blessing for me. I think any time that we that we reach when we reach that point that we're nearing retirement. And for me, retirement doesn't mean I'm going to go home and, and watch reruns on television. It means that I'll probably get my calluses back on my hands again if the Lord blesses me with additional days and years of life. Um, the true blessing has been that I've been able to be uh, a father and a husband. And uh, that, that may sound kind of awkward because I know people who can balance their lives very well and still maintain a very successful career who didn't have to come to the university to work. For me, it allowed that for me. So, um, again, just, uh, 
My daughter goes to school here now. She's pre-med. Um, my son went to school here. He's a physician's assistant, and uh, we've been able to keep our children very close. They and their families uh, live within 10 miles of us. So all of that family closeness, um, I attribute largely to the fact that I was home at night, most mm -hmm. nights. I uh, wasn't traveling somewhere, and, and my focus was not necessarily so much on building a business dynasty or anything in that in that regard. It was really more focused towards uh, take care of our business here at work and then come home and, and just love the life of a family person. So it's been a blessing. That would have been a little bit harder as a lawyer. Probably so. I would imagine anyway. And honestly, that, that was someone else's wish for me, not mine. So mm -hmm. I would have been a, a wildlife biologist if, if it was up to me. What from what got you triggered, interested in that? High oh, school. I just always loved the outside. Uh, not high school biology or something? No, no. Uh, no. Lois Bagby was a wonderful high school teacher. <laughs> but at the end of the day, uh, no, I just always loved, loved the wonder of life and just uh, the simple things in, in nature. So, still get to enjoy that though. Well, and then your position here at OSU, you could be outside some. You weren't Absolutely. totally stuck in. in no, man. No, and that, that would be my one takeaway from the technology that uh, I do tend to get too bogged down with uh, a large number of emails that need to be tended to, but uh, that's my fault for not wanting to have them go to my cell phone and be that connected, perhaps. Yes, I feel you that way too. In short, this has been an absolutely wonderful career, and I mean that. I'm very proud of to have worked with people that I work with and continue to work with to this day. Um, we have some just some awesome leadership, and I mean that. Uh, working with the Harguses, the Alligans, um, I haven't haven't been able to meet our new president and. Uh, I can just tell you that we made a good decision when we chose to move to Stillwater in 1984. It, uh, it was a good course for our life. So I'm very happy when I look back okay. and excited about the future, by the way. Retirement, uh, again, doesn't, I'm not sure what, what work-wise what that means for me. I don't think that I'll ever truly retire, Tanya, <laughs> until my health forces me to. Life's too short to just sit at, sit at home, I guess. It is that, man. <laughs> All right, I'll end with my last question then. How do you want history to remember Steve? Hmm. I told you before we started with the interview that I'm not really good at talking about myself. Um, I want to do this to help your project. Yeah. So a life of service perhaps, as opposed to, I went from being my father's son to being my son's father. Most people in, in the town I've lived in, for, or I don't live there, but outside of Perkins, most people know me as Seth's dad because he's a physician's assistant, takes care of a lot of, a lot of the local people there in the community. My father working for the Bureau of Investigation. He actually has a section of highway named after him up here by Newkirk and Blackwell, and the Sid P. Cooker, the Memorial Highway. And he was kind of a local statewide legend in law enforcement back when he was when he was alive. And so to go from being my son's father to my father's son, one could argue that I really don't have a lot of identity myself. What I know to tell you is that I think that's probably proof of how I want to live my life. I don't need, I don't need credit. I don't need anything. I don't desire that. I'm very uncomfortable sitting in front of a camera with you today. So thank you for your patience with me. I, a life of service, I suppose, would be my answer. Yeah. Well, I know OSU is very thankful that you chose chose to stay as long as you did. Thank you. So thank you for joining me today. It's been great. Thank you for having me.